Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad to see you all here. Your commitment to life is truly inspiring. My name is Katie Yarbrough. I am a student spokesperson for Students for Life of America, and I am honored to introduce our next panel, Why We Need Pro-Life Advocates Serving in the Administration. Our moderator is Bridget Weisenberger, the Director of Campaigns and Partnerships at the Heritage Foundation. In this role, she leads a team to drive integration, shape the Heritage Foundation's presence, cultivate new institutions, and build relationships across the country and around the globe. Spencer Cretien serves as the Associate Director of the Heritage Foundation's 2025 Presidential Transition Project. From 2020 to 2021, he was the Special Assistant to President Donald J. Trump and Associate Director of Presidential Personnel, helping to identify, recruit, and place hundreds of political appointees at every level of the government. Roger Severino is the Vice President of Domestic Policy of the Joseph C. and Elizabeth A. Anderlich Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Previously, Severino was the director of HHS's Office for Civil Rights, where he led a team of over 250 staff enforcing our nation's civil rights, conscience and religious freedom, and health information privacy laws. Valerie Huber is the president and CEO of the Institute for Women's Health, which exists to promote the highest attainable health and promote and well-being for women throughout every stage of their lives. Huber served America during the Trump administration as the U.S. Special Representative for Global Women's Health, where she focused on women's health and protecting, protecting the dignity and value of every human life. Let's give a warm welcome to our speakers this afternoon. All righty, thanks, Katie. So can I just, with a show of hands, how many of you are in high school? Great, how many of you are in college? And then how many of you don't fit into that category? <laughs> Excellent. And how many of you are interested in working in government? All right, a good showing. So I want to start out the conversation with our panelists. Just to start, um, Spencer, Valerie, and Roger, can you share a little bit about why you're pro-life? How did you become pro-life? Just so we know the baseline uh, to start our conversation. To you, Spencer. Well, thank you, uh, Bridget, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, I grew up right in D.C., right in this area, so it was easy for me to get involved in politics, and um, I always, uh, you know, believed in the pro-life cause. Um, it, was, it was sort of what motivated me. I was the biggest loser at my very liberal high school for going to the March for Life every year. Uh, and 10 years, 11 years ago, I was sitting in these seats at the Students for Life conferences as a college student um, in, in, in the early 2010s. So it's always been a big part of, uh, of my political views and kind of shaped my opinion of, of a lot of different political issues. Um, but it also, uh, I, I, I began to realize that um, we need people on the inside. We, we uh, as pro-lifers, as conservatives, we have disadvantages when it comes to the institutions in our, in our country and in our culture. And so uh, that's why we need we need a lot of pro-life advocates to be serving in, in important positions in this swamp. So I can't remember a time that I wasn't pro-life, but after my husband and I married, we had five very difficult pregnancies, losing one and almost losing the other four. And realized at that time that pregnancy doesn't necessarily equal birth. And it really made me, from a very personal level, appreciate the value and dignity of every life and how precious every life is. <clears throat> I was in junior high at History Day in LA where you have these projects. And one of the projects had this board that said pro-life, pro-choice. And it had the best arguments on both sides, narratives and pictures and, and information. And one had a picture of back alley abortions, the other had a picture of an unborn child who had been aborted. And to me, looking at this, reading it through, it was rather easy. I, I did not struggle at all it was very obvious to me that it's a human being and you cannot simply treat it as medical waste. 
and human dignity begins at conception, uh, scientifically so, morally so, and when you see pictures, it just drives it all the way home. It did not become politically active, really, until law school is when I really jumped in, and my faith formation inspired a lot of that. I was a late bloomer. I was confirmed in the Catholic Church in, in law school. But I was all, always pro-life, just simply on the moral and philosophical arguments, and the faith ones really supercharged it. Wonderful. So how then, you've all served in government, uh, in the administration in particular, how has having pro-lifers in the roles that you've been in, but also surrounding you, been helpful or not having them? How has that harmed our country and the, the culture of life we're seeking to cultivate? I'll start with you, Valerie, and then we'll switch Spencer then to Roger. Mixing it up. Well, I talked to colleagues who were in other presidential administrations and where pro-life policies were very difficult to implement. Being in the Trump administration was my first opportunity to serve in a presidential administration. And I came into the administration with, with two priorities. Number one was to help effectuate positive, good policy for the nation. And that included uh, taking a, a, a strong and uh, principled stand for life and for the health of women and families. Uh, the, other, the other priority was to be a person that would, um, in promoting those policies, attract those who disagreed in a way that they would want to hear our perspective. So that we would be smart, disarming, and value every person that was in uh, the government, uh, even if they weren't a political appointee, even if they maybe were even on the other side. And God really answered uh, both of those requests. And I'll never forget when um, I was the principal on the Title X regulation, <clears throat> which is um, responsible for the first time in its 50-year his history for Planned Parenthood not being funded with federal funds for, from that program, which was $60 million a year. Someone came up to me as we were working on it. They knew we were, that I and our team were working almost around the clock to get it completed because we were sure that it was going to go to the Supreme Court. Someone came up to me and said, you know, I don't agree with what you're doing. I don't think. But you're a nice person, and I want to hear your side of the story. Well, I wasn't there to be nice, although I wanted to be. I was really there uh, for a mission. And it, it made me realize that it's important for us to speak to the choir, those who agree. Um, but it's even more important for us to bring others alongside us because those career civil servants who are currently still in government can be changed by the way we live our lives and the way we explain those policies. I wanna just end the answer to this question with one other thing, and that is, it is incredibly important that you see working in the federal government under an administration as a mission. Uh, as you look toward the career that you have before you, there are a lot of things that seem exciting. Working in the federal government may not seem exciting, and it isn't exciting every day. But you can make a difference, not just in the agency you're working, not just in the administration that you're working for, but for all of America and for every single American. That first important piece is to, be, to understand your values, the reason for them, and to be unwavering in those clear values that you have. <clears throat> but the second thing, that, that is only the minimum qualification. Then you must be willing to become the expert that you must be in your position, that you must be courageous, that you must be smart, 
and you must be willing to get attacks from all sides and continue to stand. Not everyone can be that, but those who are need to seriously consider being a part of the, of the next conservative administration. I would echo everything that Valerie said, and I think when we talk about what goes on in politics in Washington, D.C., it's helpful to, to have some numbers to just put some things in perspective. Roger, as was announced, ran an office of several hundred people. There are scores of federal offices like that. There are 2.2 million full-time non-military federal employees in, in and around Washington, D.C., um, then you have all the federal contractors who actually do much of the work of government. Not many of those people are pro-life. Um, if we have a conservative pro-life president, the number of people who actually can get hired and fired by the president, who work for the president, is traditionally between three and 4,000. So there is uh, not much political control of the bureaucracy, and we need, um, we need more people, we need stronger people, we need people who are courageous, who are willing to uh, disregard the things that the media is gonna say. Um, but Valerie's also right that we, we need people to be kind, we need people to be diplomatic, and above all, we need people who have a sharp political sense. The entire trick is knowing when you can be a bull in a china shop and when you can't be. Uh, when, you're, when you're trying to advance pro-life values in a hostile environment. I'm sure many of you have faced that on your campuses. Well, the federal government is, you know, a kind of a, a, a step beyond that. But we need people who, um, who diligently, you know, who are going to be the first person there, the last person to leave, uh, who are going to look for every opportunity to advance pro-life policy. There's so much that happens that just slips through the cracks and the political appointees, that three to 4,000, don't even have the time to, uh, to look at it beforehand. So, um, you know, before I, before I worked in the White House, I worked for Secretary Ben Carson at HUD and uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and stuff would come to my desk, and I literally had to review it page by page to see is there anything in here that is pro-abortion or that contradicts what the secretary and the president have said about the life issue. Um, and you know, there are so many examples like that where we needed 10 more people like me to, to do that work. It's not, um, it's not gonna get you headlines, but we need, the, we need to do the day-to-day -day work uh, within the government. You've all heard of the deep state, and it is real. The DEI, Biden administration folks, they say they want a government and corporations that look like America. Well, the federal government does not look like America. Pro-lifers are grossly underrepresented. People of deep faith are grossly underrepresented, not by design, um, not by chance, it's by design. Which means we need to correct that imbalance because as Spencer said, when we have an administration that comes in, we do fill those political appointee slots, but they're not part of the permanent bureaucracy. They're there for four years, usually, sometimes less than that. And that's not enough time to really change the country in a permanent, enduring fashion, which is why we need the people that are still carrying the torch as career employees, so that when an administration changes, you have people that are actually eager to implement a president's policies as opposed to resistant at every turn to the duly elected president's policies, which is what we have now when we have a conservative president appointed, <clears throat> constant fights and undermining from the career staff. And a pitch for all of you, you're young. C consider your future of how you're gonna impact the world. I am a big believer that the biggest way most everybody impacts the world, get married, have babies, raise them right. That's the long-term solution to America's problems. It happens to be that work in the federal government is highly compatible with people who are married and have babies, right? There's a lot of benefits to government service, civil servant protections, very hard to get fired when you get in. That means that's job security. If the economy goes down, guess what? Government grows. If the economy goes up, guess what? Government grows, which is great for job security. So consider that 
as you're thinking longer term, how my family fits in with my career, and if you can integrate your pro-life work, especially in offices where you see things that, wow, the law says we cannot fund abortion. There's laws like the Hyde Amendment, et cetera, and that would cross over your desk. You might be the one person to say, hey, we need to talk to the lawyers about this before we fund this, and you could actually help save lives as a career person, but you have to get, in, get your foot in the door. So definitely consider going and applying as a career, and if the administration is right, also as a political appointee. Wonderful, so we're gonna get to audience questions soon, but I have one last question for our panelists, and that is, not everyone here is called to serve in government, uh, and so how are different jobs of citizens across America, you know, you have moms, you have journalists, you have engineers, you have doctors, I'm sure there's some careers you guys are thinking of that I'm not thinking of at the moment, but how do those all fit in, and how does that help when you are in government, have uh, that support? What role can they play in building a culture of life, particularly in our policies uh, in America? And I'll start with you, Spencer, and then Roger will end with you, Valerie. Well, there's a role for everybody to play, and I think one of the biggest um, misperceptions that some people have about, um, I know we're not supposed to talk about, we're serving in government, is, uh, you know, you, you don't have to be a lawyer who's argued before the Supreme Court. You don't have to have written 50 books. You don't need a PhD in political science. Um, you don't need to have letters of recommendation from, from 20 different senators. That's not how this works. I mean, the, the thing is, uh, what we're doing at Project 2025 is we're building the network that we need. So we're identifying the people ahead of time um, and not all of them are going to serve in government, but we need our outside allies. And we and everybody ought to have um, in in your mind the the sense that you know we we all have tools, we all have gifts, and uh, I think the the federal government is one example, but also those of you who are going to work in corporate America. I mean, look at your health care policy. Look, does it cover abortion? Are you paying for that? Um, be careful about what, where you buy and, and uh, do business. Uh, we, we conservatives, pro-life people, don't, we're behind the left when it comes to organizing on those types of things. So there is a role for everybody, whether you're, um, whether you're an engineer or a, a lawyer or a doctor. Uh, certainly anybody in the medical profession uh, ought to be extremely careful, first of all, but also look for areas to thread the, you know, to, to advance ground, to take some, to get some yardage on the field because all the institutions are, are pro-abortion and it, we gotta fight back on all fronts. We're fighting against a culture that is anti-life and it's infected every facet of society, which means all of you are facing it, all of you are living it, and no matter what career path you take, you're pretty much gonna have to face this question. Um, so, how do you live your pro-life values? Well, number one, never actually assist or participate in anything having to do with abortion. Like that has got to be the clearest, brightest line. You never go along with it. And when you see it, you call it out. That's the next step. So you have to register some form of dissent. So you don't just silently go along. And that may come at a cost. That may come at a cost. It's a cost worth bearing. And I, it, there will be these occasions in your life, especially in professional life, where you will very likely be faced with one of these decisions where, wow, this is going to get some people upset if I live my values and speak them out. And that's going to be a time of testing. So be, be ready for those moments. And it's worth it. And to, be, to make it easier, surround yourself with a network of people. So... You don't have to go in guns blazing in the new workplace as the new guy. Um, however, find out where your friends are. Find out where your friends are. So when the time does come when you have one of these challenges in the workplace, when they ask you to do something you can't support, uh, you're, you have that backing that is there to help you if things get tough. Because if we live a, a life of, of faith, of integrity on these issues, there will be some tough times, but it is absolutely worth it. 
That's called moral courage. I want to respond to that, que the, that question by giving you an illustration, and there's a handout at your, at your seats um, that's part of that illustration, that helps bring those who are working in government together with those who are not. The illustration is something that I was just really honored to be able to be um, a, a part to, of standing up as U.S. Special Representative for Global Women's Health. It was the first coalition ever created in the world among nations to support life, to support the family, to support faith, I mean, to support health and the sovereignty of nations to defend those values. Pro-abortion lobbyists, organizations, international organizations, and other go governments have for decades been pressuring pro-life countries to liberalize their laws and to accept abortion. And there was never a coalition to, to stand in solidarity for life and for family. So we started the Geneva Consensus Declaration. The one pager before you is what we give to governments as they're considering joining. When we started that coalition, um, there were countries that hated one another that were in this coalition. Um, some of them almost or eventually at war with one another. But on these issues, they agreed. The Biden administration on inauguration day removed that policy from US government website and it was the only one we found removed on inauguration day and why is that? Because when countries stand together in support of life, that says something that's never been said before. So our organization is working with the current government that is responsible for this coalition. It's not the US right now because President Biden is pressuring countries to leave this coalition. We're a nonprofit organization and we partner with individuals who are pro-life all around the country and all around the world. So they're healthcare professionals, they're lawyers, they're nonprofit organizations, they're graphic designers, they are website designers, they are PR consultants. Do you get the message? And what are they doing? They are helping this coalition become stronger, grow, and it's coming alongside in an amazing way to help these countries to stand for life, to stand for family. So you don't have to be in the government but you have to know where there are opportunities for you to use the skills, the calling you have to make an impact, to leave a legacy. And as one person told us, this, when successful, can save more lives than overturning Roe v. Wade ever can because there are millions and millions of abortions that unnecessarily take place because governments have caved to the pressure and the, and the, and the legal um, losses that they have endured because no one was standing alongside them. Thanks, Valerie. And that uh, kind of reminds me, there's, there's another part that you could do, and you might be called to make some money. And as a college professor, an English professor told a class of us once, money doesn't always suck. So if you are called to go out into the world and make money, you can use this for good. So there's lots of ways uh, to get involved. I want to give Spencer a minute to talk about Project 2025. You saw the video when you walked in. Uh, and just give us a quick overview of that. And then we'll have a microphone out in the audience. If you have a question, you can raise your hand. Sure. How, raise your hand if you pre before today if you've heard of Project 2025. OK, great. So. Um, we are organized by the Heritage Foundation, um, and we're building on the success that the Heritage Foundation has had in the past at uh, providing policy advice and people to work in conservative administrations. But this time around for 2025, the new president's gonna take office one year from today. 
Um, we're doing it bigger and better. Uh, and so we are not just the Heritage Foundation, but we've got more than 90 coalition partners, including Students for Life, including Valerie's organization, the Institute for Women's Health, uh, Susan B. Anthony, ADF, many names that you have heard of. Um, and what we're doing is we're trying to do as much now of the president's, the future president's work that we can. Um, and I would encourage all of you to check us out at project2025.org. Um, we have a 900-page uh, policy book that explores the intricacies of federal agencies. Um, we have a personnel database. If you are interested in working for the next president, we have replicated as much as possible of what that process, what that application process looks like. So go ahead and put your resume in our, in our system, make a profile in our database, and then we also have a training academy. So if you've wondered, what's it like to work in Washington? How am I going to deal with the media? How, how do I get a security clearance? How do I... Um, get a, do my financial disclosure, things like that. We have interactive online videos, about 30 of them now at project2025.org that you can sign up, you can enroll in our, in our academy. So, um, and then I would just say also two last things. Uh, spread the word to your family and friends, your pro-life colleagues. Um, the left, the pro-abortion side is very fired up and concerned about what we're doing, as you saw in that video. Um, foreign embassies, foreign delegations are interested in what we're doing. Our challenge is we need our people, uh, our pro-life conservative people across America to get fired up about Project 2025 and to know that help is on the way and that they have something to vote for. And then my last uh, piece of advice is do not, especially for those who are in high school or college, um, do not fall into the trap of thinking that you're too young or that you're too inexperienced. Um, you, if you have the right values and you have a willingness to work hard, that's what we want. Uh, if you, you will become a policy expert, you will learn uh, how to navigate the deep state and how to, how to you know, hold a job in an agency and that stuff you can learn. But what you can't learn is your values and your, your you know, a willingness to work hard and fight for life. Uh, and so that's what we want. Uh, don't, don't, um, don't, don't fall into the temptation of thinking that, well, I could just, I, how could I ever work in DC? If I can do it, you can do it. Wonderful, all right, we're open for audience questions. And I believe we have one up here. Coming to you now. Hi, I just wanted to say thank you all for your advice. Um, as a college student myself, that's also Catholic and pro-life. Sometimes I struggle when those, when that's not being reflected on my campus, and a lot of times it can be very isolating. So, as pro-life people yourself, how did you kind of navigate that, especially you know during your college days? During my undergrad, I was not active, as I mentioned. It took until law school. But in law school is when I joined the Pro-Life Religious Liberty Club at Harvard. And that is quite a hostile place for pro-lifers. But again, it, it was all worth it. So you may think that some doors may close. And it's true. There may have been some opportunities that were foregone because of that. But God always provides. And so many other doors opened up because I had taken a public stand when I was in law school. And that allowed me to get a job at the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, which allowed me to get a job at DOJ Civil Rights, and which allowed me to get a job at Heritage when I spoke out on marriage, uh, which I thought, no, that might close some doors. Well, it opened up a door to being in the Trump transition, right? It was all these connections that even though you might not see a path that, of the good that comes of it, don't worry about that because God tends to provide when you do the right thing. I'm just going to say P.S. on to what Roger just said. <clears throat> I didn't have any problem in college because I went to a conservative Christian college. Um, but in high school, I was a very shy person. Um, but my sense of right and wrong and justice overrode my shyness. 
And so although I may not have been the right spokesperson, um, I, would in, uh, I would talk to our administration and teachers about uh, bringing other views into conversation uh, rather than just the dominant view. And as a result of that, we had a very good um, opportunity to have both a pro and con. Um, and you know your own personalities, you also know the realities, but I go back, whether uh, during the time of the, in the administration, right now, or when I was younger, our responsibility is to be faithful, not to ensure what the result is. That's up to God. But being faithful, to, it really, uh, we have to be we have to be wise and discerning of the opportunities and the situations, and then take advantage of every single one of them. I heard a quote once: "You and Jesus are a majority," um, and. Remember that. Even also finding just uh, you know two or three like-minded people can go a long way. And then on the worst days, just remember that it doesn't last forever. You will get through college, and uh, time tends to speed up also as you as you uh, get older. But I think uh, just you, you've got you've got friends in high places. Uh, hopefully, and and especially if there is a, a new president, um, and we're going to be there for you. And one other point, if you do step out publicly and you get these attacks, and all of us have, some of them quite vicious, one thing to keep in mind is if, as much as it's, it's rough, it's not pleasant to be in that, that circumstance, but they want to knock you down and make an example of you whenever you stick up, okay? If you retreat after you've stepped forward, it doesn't make things easier for you. You've been damaged and they realize they could get to you and they're always gonna keep you down now. But if you stay standing after they've given you their best shot, what tends to happen, they switch targets to a weaker target. Because you stood up and they wanna go, because they're bullies, so they go for a weaker target. So if you withstand that initial onslaught, if you're in some public controversy, especially in the Twitter age, uh, stand strong and it, it will blow over and you'll still be there and you're still alive and hey, it's okay. All right, more questions. You can also make sure you're very kind. It's very hard for people to hate you when you treat them with dignity and respect. Other questions? Any? All right, we have one up front here. Oh. Coming around. All right, so in Project 2025, if uh, the, if a Republican got elected and we like did that whole bureaucracy where we, we, we like filled them up for conservatives, would their jobs be protected if a Democrat came in the next like two terms? It's a good question. So first of all, we are, we cannot be partisan and we are not. Um, and you know, we, we say the next conservative president, but we'll work with anybody. Um, the thing you have to remember is that, so the, the numbers I mentioned earlier, there are uh, more than 2 million full-time federal employees. For the, the vast majority of those have insane job security that you would never have in the private sector. Um, the people who serve at the pleasure of the president, the three to 4,000 political appointees, they, don't, they have no job security. The president can fire them for any reason or no reason. Um, now, as it stands right now, that's how it is. And what Roger was saying, and he makes a very good point, is if you can burrow in, get get into the federal government as a career federal employee, they actually, they can't cancel you. They can't fire you. I mean, they, they you will get a paycheck for the rest of your life, pretty much. Unless you pull an Edward Snowden, you are pretty good. Um, but if you, uh, if you look at the, uh, the way it's structured overall, we, we do want to bring more political accountability to the bureaucracy. Speaking as Project 2025, you know, we want to be able to reward high performers, get rid of low performers, as you would at any reasonable um, organization. Uh, but you, I think the, uh, 
the tradition in this country uh, is that we're, we're never going to see a day um, when people are dismissed as federal employees for opinions that they have. Um, and as uh, you know, there's no situation where you would be more cancelable in the federal government than in the private sector. Um, that's, that's my take on there's it. One situation, and it's fairly new. That's absolutely right. The job security is amazing. It's once you're in, you're in. Um, one exception is po policies on pronouns now in the federal government where if you use the wrong pronoun, your job, wrong pronoun, your job may be in jeopardy. And that's one of those things where that may come to you as to where you stand on your values and if you're willing to stand up for them. But generally speaking, the First Amendment does apply to federal workers. So if you do say something pro-life on Twitter on your own time, they can't fire you for that. Whereas in the private sector, they often do unless it's faith-based and that's discrimination based on faith. So even though this breakout was about political appointees and being a part of the next administration, there are really two career tracks that I would um, recommend when I talked at the very beginning about consider federal service as a mission field. So one is the, uh, you can be fired at any time, but you can make amazing differences in four or eight years, and that's the political appointee position. Or you can decide that you are going to be a long-term missionary in the federal service, and that is by applying through the normal, uh, what is it, usajobs.gov, uh, where it's your career, and you have the opportunity to make a huge difference over the long haul. And I would encourage you to consider both of those as viable. Wonderful. Question in the back. Now that Roe versus Wade is no longer an obstacle to the federal government protecting the unborn, what do you think are the chances that the next conservative president will create some sort of special office that is focused on finding the best ways for the federal government to protect unborn life? And do you think that's something that the pro-life movement should be calling on the conservative candidates to commit to doing, to have that office dedicated to the cause? Yes and yes. We, on Project 2025, are working precisely on that, making sure we could institutionalize the post Dobbs environment, whereas Biden is trying to reinstitutionalize Roe in every possible way using levers of the federal government to have Department of Defense fund abortions to indemnify DOD doctors who perform abortions contrary to state law to conduct abortions in the VA, to redefine HIPAA, HIPAA, to exclude unborn persons, to using HHS regs to require abortions in emergency departments contrary to state law. We need to undo all of those, and Project 2025, the Mandate for Leadership book, has a chapter on HHS that addresses essentially all of those, and we're working on what we call Pillar 4, the project, to start working on those sorts of executive orders and regulations that will undo that and institutionalize a pro-life culture. One of the things I'm very proud of when we were at HHS under Trump, in the strategic plan for the agency, we define the mission as furthering the health and well-being of all Americans from conception until natural death. That was the official position of the federal government with respect to the Department of Health and Human Services. And in those sorts of things, carry over through all aspects of the federal government. It starts with having a president that's willing to fight for it and then appointing the right people that will execute and implement it. And if I could take that conversation then to the, the United States influence abroad, uh, we need to get it right here domestically and save as many lives as we possibly can. But the US influence abroad can be a force for good or a force for ill. And in the area of abortion, when Roe v. Wade was overturned with Dobbs, a communication went out to every one of our embassies around the world by the Biden administration. And what was it about? 
It was talking points how to subvert the Supreme Court decision in policy discussions abroad to every country that we are now behind the scenes pressuring to liberalize their abortion laws. And so we need to realize that for the hundreds of millions of Americans and those who can be saved, there are billions that we can also protect by our pro-life policies with international uh, policies as well. I'll just say quickly, well, first of all, Roger neglected to mention that he is the author of that chapter on the Department of Health and Human Services, and it's a fantastic chapter. Um, but uh, I, encourage you, I encourage you all to read it. It talks about, you know, not only the main HHS building, but the FDA, the National Institutes for Health, all the many great attacks on, on the Dr. Fauci's of the world. But um, on, on your question, do we need uh, like an office? We do. Um, one, one example is, you know, there are special envoys at the State Department. So the Biden administration has John Kerry as their special envoy for climate. They have a special envoy for LGBT rights around the world. We need a, a at the State Department, you know, we need to create a, a special envoy for life and family. But very importantly, this new office cannot be a substitute for uh, having people at the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Justice, USAID, the State Department, because the way the the way the system operates is that the, the president's power resides legally at the agencies. You can create a new position, but legally the agencies are, are where the power has been delegated, so we still need the people uh, in, the, in the old jobs at the agencies. All right, one more question. We have one over here. So, um, <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a special ed teacher, and I um, find myself, um, I'm pr particularly interested in um, a lot of the talks about education in the U.S. and um, the direction that education is going, and um, I, hear, I hear a lot in the conservative movement, um, all these talks, like, it's, it's, it's like all these talks about, like, all, all the current problems in education with, like, of, like, the political indoctrination in the schools and all that stuff. Um, so what is, um, what would you say our vision as, um, as conservatives and as Christians is um, regarding um, what, uh, what we should be promoting in education and what, um, what do we want, want education to look like? Education <clears throat> starts in the home. That's the first thing. The parents are the primary guardians of the well-being of their children and their education. It's been recognized by the Supreme Court as such. So we have to make sure that once you all become parents, and some of you may already be parents, that you be the guardians of your children's education. Seek alternatives. We now have universal school choice in close to a dozen states now and this is brand new, we need that because we have to break the government education monopoly, which is indoctrinating our kids. Of course, we wanna shut down the Department of Education at the federal government. It's the source of far more evil than good. <clears throat> and as long as it's there, limit their abilities to influence and take away the power from the parents. Now, a point that's related more broadly, the Department of Education issues regulations all the time which are now governing us. It used to be that Congress passed laws. Now it's agents, agencies and bureaucrats passing regulations that have the effect of law. So the transgender mandates on sports, all of that is coming from regulations from the Department of Education. You could fight back by filing comments to regulations. Has anybody here ever filed a comment on a federal regulation. One, two, nice, excellent. I wanna see next summit, every hand go up. Because this is the ability for you to actually have your voice be heard, right? It's no longer call your member of Congress or your senator's office. It is file a comment with a federal agency when they want to force abortion 
in federal programs that affect you, right? Uh, Heritage Foundation, we run programs where we educate people on federal agency actions that hurt you on everything, but including life. And we have portals where you could type in your name and write your comment, or we could have samples. They're required to read them and respond to them. And if they don't respond appropriately, we can sue them and enjoin them in court. So please become knowledgeable of what it means as a citizen to participate in filing comments on federal reg regulations that, that hurt you. And when, if we're back in power, that will help you. File comments that, that are supportive as well. I, Valerie, you want to? I would say, um, as conservatives and pro-life people, I think, uh, remember, don't give up on the public schools. We, we are going to have school choice. We need to break the monopoly. But the time when we're going to win is when liberal parents have their kids come home and say, Mommy, I learned that abortion is wrong today in school. We, that's when we're going to win. Uh, so we need, we need conservative teachers, too. And thank you for what you do. But um, I, I think we need, we need to... Uh, we can't have the Benedict option on everything. You know, we've got to, the, the majority of kids are going to be in the public schools. Uh, so that's where we got to fight. So I'm going to take what Roger said and Spencer said and agree with both and kind of bring them together and by, by saying this. Wherever you are, wherever your influence is, if you are a parent, be involved at the, um, the, the local level at the school board, at, with uh, principals, with teachers, with other parents. If you are, an, are not a parent, uh, you have an opportunity uh, in your community to make sure that you vote. At the, at the state and the federal level where policies are made, ensure that education policies are about education, not ideology. And uh, lastly, to Roger's point regarding regulations, if I, I want to put an exclamation point on that. Since I was the principal on the Title X regulation, which I told you about, we received over 100,000 comments. There was a very strategic campaign in those comments, such that Planned Parenthood, on the last day of comments, brought boxes of printed comments to the front desk of HHS knowing that we would have to stay up all night to make sure that they were registered by the, by the deadline. When you, compare with the, uh, when you compare the number of comments that were made by those who opposed the pro-life stance, it was embarrassing. We need to do better. 99% of the comments were pro-abortion. And that 1% that were not were not well done. They didn't offer the information we begged pro-life advocates and experts to give. We need to do better. So we're going to wrap up here, but I want to ask our panelists one closing question. What, from your time working in the administration, is something that you are most proud of doing? And Spencer, would you like to start? Well, um, I I was in the presidential personnel office under President Trump, and so this is the office that handles the small group of people in the government who actually report to the president. President of the United States doesn't have the hours in the day to personally hire them all, so he outsources that to PPO, the presidential personnel office. And I'm most proud of the uh, conservative pro-life people who... I got into positions of power in Washington, um, not only at the Senate confirmed level at the you know top of the federal workforce, but also the 22 year olds. It was COVID in 2020, people had been laid off. They were looking for jobs and uh, getting some of them in and actually starting them on the track to one day being future, future cabinet secretaries. I think that's what I'm most proud of. Uh, for me, on the domestic side, it was definitely the Title X regulation um, and seeing that for the first time in 50 years, Planned Parenthood was not getting these funds. And then looking out my window and almost every week seeing a pro-abortion organization, uh, not always Planned Parenthood, picketing because of that, 
that really brought a smile to my face. On the international, it has to be the Geneva Consensus Declaration, that coalition of nations that today are standing strong against the Biden administration and other countries that are pressuring them to liberalize their abortion laws. So I had mentioned the correct formulation of the mission of HHS, and I think I'm proud of how we actualize that, we enforced conscience laws that protected people who stood for the defense of unborn life. We did an enforcement action that had a disallowance of $200 million of Medicaid funds that were taken away from California because they were forcing an order of nuns to provide abortion insurance for their fellow nuns. California was requiring this and that was a gross violation of law, and we actually held them accountable. After years of begging and pleading us, the federal government stepped forward and said, you're right, we are coming to help you, we're gonna hold the state accountable. The sad part of the story is immediately afterwards, the Biden administration, administration comes in and reverses it, which is it underscores the importance of personnel being policy, right? My, my successor, they were put there to undo what I had helped do. And that's why it matters who's at the White House and then who that person appoints, because that is a difference between life and death in, in many circumstances. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us uh, today. If you want to stop by Heritage's table downstairs, and I believe our panelists are happy to chat with you outside. <laughs>